Well, good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast for Timer Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, March 20th, 2022. We've got another great show for you this week. I'm going to be joined by members of media, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. We're going to kick off the show this week with a, a look at what's happening in markets, and there's been a lot of a lot of things that we need to really digest, and there's no person better to do that than the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network. You can find him uh, at Market Morning Trade Live and Markets on the Close. We're talking about Mr. Oliver Rennick. Oliver, thanks so much for joining us and kicking us kicking off the show this morning. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. All right, Oliver. Uh, it's been a big week. Um, let's start with. Uh, interest rates, uh, the Federal Reserve, the Federal, Federal Open Market Committee uh, deciding to raise interest rates by a quarter point, it's the federal funds rate, mm -hmm. your reaction and the reaction of markets? Uh, well, pretty much confirmation of uh, what people had been expecting and the Fed living up to oh. its own uh, plans as outlined. Nothing that is um, uh, additionally surprising uh, beyond what was already expected, but still very a, a symbolic moment with uh, Fed hiking for the first time post-COVID and uh, really kind of uh, acknowledging that this economy is something very different than it was, you know, over the last couple of years when you're able to tighten interest rates. It certainly is a, a, a very confident uh, thing by the Fed and Jay Powell did really uh, try to hammer home a message of economic confidence. And uh, we see the market processing that. Uh, and we see that um, there's some degree of comfort so far um, against the backdrop of uh, a week in which uh, the situation in Ukraine um, didn't seem to uh, really throw any wild card data. So uh, the market was able to find its legs this week. It, it, it's, it seems it seems like that is the case. And obviously, um, let's talk about inflation for a second, because th this is all kind of predicated on inflation. Americans feeling a lot of pressure, gasoline, oil prices through the roof, retail, uh, you know, uh, food, food prices um, going mm -hmm. through the roof as well. This this really has to potentially dampen some of that spending in other places that the economy relies on. 100%. Uh, we are seeing uh, real wage growth lagging behind inflation and um, wage growth lagging behind inflation. So real wage growth coming down, uh, something that uh, economists have expected to kick in uh, due to the tight labor market for a month now, and it really hasn't so much. So there is still a curiosity of why the labor market is uh, having trouble uh, filling the jobs. And uh, that's something that Powell is uh, waxing a, a good degree of confidence in that uh, to some extent we just kind of have to trust him. Um, but there are certainly plenty of reasons to doubt the, the kind of uh, quality maybe of uh, the economic strength right now, because generally the employment picture is the most consistent one and uh, the most important one to the Fed here. It's been very consistently positive, uh, but that is, it definitely still has some issues because those jobs aren't getting filled quickly enough. Uh, so he's going to go about his rate hikes. He's going to try and push back on inflation. And the one part that I don't think uh, investors still are appreciating enough is, uh, I believe, this is just kind of a personal interpretation based on the logic and based on how the Fed has communicated the last year, that they are uh, probably going to feel very comfortable inducing some market volatility and um, to some degree um, creating some uh, kind of value destruction in an extremely frothy market in order to potentially stimulate uh, some of those uh, job, um, uh, some of those those job kind of uh, uh, disconnections we have right now in the job market where people are uh, not taking the job. So I think the Fed will be very comfortable uh, applying pressure to a market that uh, could potentially get people back into the workforce. Oliver, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Outside of the human toll that it's taking, there's uh, death, lots of death and destruction. That is incalculable and immeasurable what that means long term to humanity. But let's talk about the implications to the 
the market. Obviously, a lot of Europe depends on Russian, uh, some of Russian resources, uh, the potential there to cut that off. But what is this conflict that really could become a broader conflict? We hope that doesn't happen, involving more parties. We don't want to get there. But what does this mean in terms of the global market? Has it reached the U.S., number one? And what is the impact to Europe and uh, the surrounding uh, continents? Well, right now, the biggest uh, result of this is higher prices of commodities. And that generally dovetails right into the existing inflation regime and the pricing pressure that is eroding away at savings and household wealth and is applying pressure to the stock market and, of course, is driving the Fed to tighten the reins on the economy a bit. So the impact uh, of commodity prices going up as a result of this conflict is uh, a very, very big deal. And even though right now it seems investors are trying to digest and gain some comfort with the Fed's path, this is uh, not even including really what is going to show up in the near future inflation numbers due to what's happening in Ukraine. The commodity price moves that we saw over the last several weeks are going to show up in our next uh, batch of inflation prints, and they're going to be some very, very serious numbers. So uh, ultimately, uh, strangely enough, ironically enough, or unfortunately enough, however you want to describe it, the impact right now, the most visible economic impact of that particular conflict is exacerbating existing issues from a pricing perspective. Oliver, all week long, you've had guests on the program and, and know it. Look, let's face it. None of us are geopolitical experts. None of us know what is going to happen. We're just um, pontificating and thinking about it. But what's the general consensus uh, based on all the moves that we you've discussed this week? We've we've done a very superficial covering it right now on the, between you and I and, 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 and the show and this podcast. But um, what's the consensus? I mean, what do, what do the asset managers that you talk to, the financial professionals you talk to, uh, what are they thinking about as all this stuff plays out? Because it's not a zero-one game, right? It's it's not true false. It's, there's a lot of moving pieces you have to account for. And is anyone really accounting for all of them? Yeah, it's very difficult to uh, figure out how all of these uh, news stories are going to synthesize Ukraine. Uh, the Fed, and now also China's COVID cases and China's relationship with its uh, big tech companies. So we're certainly at a very uh, kind of strange point here where suddenly a lot of uh, new problems arrived as we seemingly closed the book, at least uh, in the most extreme sense uh, on COVID, where we're no longer dealing with those extreme outcomes. Uh, We've managed to find ourselves at the intersection of several other pretty major cross currents and uh, yeah nobody um nobody knows right i mean uh, it's very difficult to try and make any decisions from an investment perspective on one's supposition of what a world leader from a totally different part of the world might do um you know it doesn't really matter kind of what uh, poli sci degree or history you have it's uh, fairly diluted down to a, a singular person's decisions when it comes to Vladimir Putin or even Xi Jinping when you're dealing with um, you know, authorities in uh, countries with a very different system than our own that, are, that can have such influence from a single person's decision. That, uh, yeah. It's just uh, a point with even to try and, and guess, but uh, relationship-wise, looking at markets, we know two things. We know that if the conflict continues, it's going to lead to rising prices and elevated prices in Ukraine. And uh, if the China situation worsens uh, with their COVID outbreak, then that is going to uh, lead to some uh, potential supply chain disruptions that are also inflationary, but also uh, demand destruction problems that can create serious volatility in both directions. So uh, it's definitely a market where uh, the short-term swings are very powerful and uh, able to be capitalized upon, but uh, with that comes risk too, where uh, this is not a market where buying the dip has remained obvious, uh, despite some of the strength this week. It's, it's it's always amazing to me, or it has been amazing, how COVID has just dropped off. Uh, except in China, you hear about the COVID cases, but the first here in the U.S., it, it's really dropped off the mm-hmm. radar. We've been talking a lot about yeah. this this invasion, uh, the price of oil, the price of gas, and other 
headwinds or potential headwinds. Oliver, we're going to leave yeah, it Yeah, a lot of good like, things happening here. Yeah, yeah. And, and we should talk about those things because uh, maybe next time we don't have to, you know, I know you're really busy, but there are positives. They're not always just negatives. There are always counters oh, to yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver, we're going to leave it there. Really appreciate you stepping off the set and coming on the, the network. We know you're incredibly busy with bookending the uh, programming on TD Ameritrade Network. Enjoy the Thanks, rest Jeff. of your week, weekend, and we'll talk to you again very soon. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Welcome back. Now we're going to shift gears, talk about regulation, legislation, litigation, and all of the above. There's a lot more to talk about. Joining us online, he is one half of the famed uh, legal eagle, of the famed legal eagles, I should say. We're talking to David Levine, principal with Groom Law Group, an employee benefits law firm based in good old Washington, D.C. David, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Jeff, thanks for having me. It's good to be with the listeners as well. Yeah, I know your son's Kevin. Kevin's off today, but... Uh, we certainly appreciate having you on, and, and, and uh, we, we will look forward to having him back next week. What's top of mind this week? I know we talked on the network uh, twice, really, Sunday, so a week ago, and earlier in the week, I think it was Wednesday, with you and Kevin about crypto. That was some big news, but there was also some big news around prohibited transactions uh, from the Department of Labor. Absolutely. and. Some of you may say, wow, this is my morning yawn if I hear the word prohibited transaction, and I understand that. So what went on? Well, before the crypto guidance last week, the Department of Labor put out an update to its procedures for obtaining an individual prohibited transaction exemption. And some of you may say, again, why do I care? Well, it's, it sounds like it's just a procedural document, and it is, but it has a number of notable items in there that could be relevant, not just in the prohibited transaction world, but in a broader area, especially in investigations, regardless of whether you are a service provider or a plan sponsor. Basically, under ERISA, the way it works, Jeff, is that ERISA, I, I often like to say, ERISA is almost like a backwards law. It's ERISA broadly prohibits most things unless they are allowed. For instance, most people know this, you cannot pay someone to give support and advice to your plan unless you pay them reasonable compensation. The real technical is you can't pay them, but there's an exemption, a prohibited transaction exemption for reasonable compensation. There's different types of exemptions that allow basically our world to operate. Uh, one of which is in the statute, the law itself, ERISA, which is like the one about reasonable comp. Another type is so-called class exemptions. This is where the Department of Labor has come out and said, you know, we need something to make the system work. And this is a simplification. So we're going to put out a rule that if you follow a bunch of our rules, you can do it. The one we've talked to a lot recently is Prohibited Transaction 202002, which has gotten a lot of play about potentially conflicted advice and all those things. And it's also being challenged in court right now. The third is individual prohibited transactions, where the Department of Labor can conclude that, yes, in a specific situation, someone uh, should be able to do something that might be technically otherwise prohibited. And yeah, the DOL has procedures for applying for these exemptions. But over the years, there's been some things that have developed all kind of almost like lore that relate to, for instance, the independence of certain parties and the role of independent fiduciaries and how if you need to have someone appraise property, what the DOL wants in terms of them and their limits on liability and other things. Again, this all sounds really wonky. So why should you care? The key takeaway on this is the DOL in their updated guidance has, made, has sort of formally stated, for instance, if you need someone to appraise, they can't just have a limit on liability that just is endless. Why does that raise a question? Well, let's take it to it's a real practical thing. While there aren't as many defined benefit plans, there, there are still a good number of them out there. And what's going on is uh, a lot of times a defined benefit plan, just like Kevin and I have talked many times, will invest in things like different asset classes that may not be as liquid because these are long-term plans. But sometimes the opportunity comes up to terminate a plan and shut it down, if you're, especially if it's frozen. And sometimes there are assets that don't have as easily a way to be liquidated. 
So sometimes you need to sell them to a third party or even you might not want to sell them to an affiliate. Yet you might need an exemption. What's happened is there have been some people applying for exemptions during this past couple of years to say, hey, I, the sponsor, want to buy a bag. But you need an independent evaluation. Nobody's questioning that. But there have been, but the DOL has, has said, well, your appraiser needs to be, uh, need, needs to take on liability. And there's only so much money paid for these services. So the DOL has put out rules now formally saying that appraisers have li restrictions on ability to limit their liability in order to get the individual exemption for an employer to buy. One other example I'll give really, really quickly, Jeff, is they talk, the DOL in here talks about what it means to be independent. And without getting into all the weeds, the, the what they put out puts a basically kind of lower threshold than most people have seen in the past under DOL guidance. It could be as little as 2% of a revenue. Keep, someone's revenue keeps a independent fiduciary from being independent. That raises the question of, if you're a startup independent fiduciary, how do you satisfy them? And so that, that and also, even for bigger independent fiduciaries, unless you're part of a big integrated financial institution, how do you have that type of independence? Again, all this sounds wonky. And you may say, well, I don't need an exemption, but these standards could come into play. And that's where it really comes up. Independence, if you're in a questioning where the DOL is doing an investigation, it is a potential leap from the DOL to say, well, we said this in our exemption procedures, we consider this for enforcement. So that means if you're designing a product or if you're purchasing a product, there's something that could come into play. I know this is very weedy, Jeff. The key is it could have some it could have some echo effects in enforcement later that have the, the rule of well potentially unintended consequences. I know that was really wonky. I apologize, Jeff. Well, David, I don't think that was wonky. It, I think it was really spot on. I think there's a lot to take away here if you're a fiduciary, a plan sponsor. And even a participant, there's a lot that goes into managing these retirement programs, a lot that goes on in this ecosystem. We're going to have to leave it there, David. Great to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Welcome back, and now we're going to turn our attention to consumer products and technology. Joining us online, he's the managing editor of The Street.com. We're talking about Daniel Klein. Dan, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Dan, I love talking tech with you. Uh, we're going to get the two really interesting stories. This one, though, has me a bit concerned, especially in light of what's happening in the Ukraine um, and, you know, that people trust art artificial intelligence, fake faces more than real ones. And I don't think anyone's tried to fake myself. I hope not, because I, I mean, I, I don't think I'd be worth it, but... This was, I think, came out from the um, what is it, the monetary IMF or the WEF World Economic Forum. What did you take away from this? So, Jeff, that video you sent me asking for my social security card, uh, social that security me. number cards, that was fake. That was fake. That was not me. That was not me. That was uh, a hacker in uh, somewhere else. <laughs> so, what we're talking about here is the ability to fake faces has gotten so good that on the positive side, let's say I'm trying to. Uh, I don't know, get you pay attention to traffic laws or, or, or other, other things that are for the mutual benefit, I can create a fake face that's not based on a real person that's incredibly trustworthy. That is, in theory, a positive. The negative is it's not hard to create a fake Jeff or a fake Dan and, uh, and give out terrible advice or do things that are illegal um, or, you know, show Jeff robbing a store or whatever it might be. So, yeah, it's a real problem, and we need legislation around this. And the problem is, and we've talked about this before, in the U.S. at least, Congress is not particularly young, and they don't really understand what this is. Look, most of Congress is the age that falls for these scams, not the age that's good at catching these scams. You know, you're much more likely to, to get a senator to give you money to get their grandchild out of jail, which, of course, he's not. Um, than you are to get them to pass legislation that would fix this. And the reality is legislation doesn't top, stop people from doing bad things. So this is a really big problem. It is. And, and this is the technology, by the way, that people see on things like The Mandalorian. Remember they de-aged Luke Skywalker? And it, yes. they took Mark, Mark Hamill's face 
uh, de-aged him and put him on top of another actor's body, and you thought it was really Luke Skywalker from after, you know, 1983's Return of the Jedi. And then he made another appearance, I guess, later on in uh, the Man- in, in the Mandalorian, or it's, maybe it was Bo- Book of Boba Fett, but it doesn't, you know what I mean. It was, so, it was Book of Boba Fett. And here's the reality. If you remember, they did the same thing with Carrie Fisher, with uh, Princess Leia, in, yeah. in, in one of the, the, the movies. And the reality is that was just a few years ago, and it wasn't that good. And yeah. Luke Skywalker on a television show, uh, Mark Hamill, was really good. So this technology has improved. And look, I don't think we're that far from this being a viable technology that you can do on your, like, $2,000 Mac. Yeah, it, it, it certainly needs people to pay attention. And I guess how do we um, – we know that – Congress has to pass all laws, right? So they have to focus on that. Then there's regulation. They can, uh, the executive branch can direct an entity to do regulation. But how do we, until that happens, how do we as individuals, how do you and I, uh, our parents, uh, our children, uh, or in, in your case, your child, how do you discern between what is real and what is not real? And how do you take, do you take the internet and do you take social media as gospel? Dan, I, I have really turned off a lot of social media, uh, checking in just once or twice a day in the, in, in the bookends, morning and end, and, and try to give my brain a, 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 relax, a relaxation. But how do we help people discern between what's, what's true and what's not true? I think if you don't know what something is, you have to be skeptical. And the, the reality is, even when you think you know something, it, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe Matthew McConaughey is recommending a, a, a new you know, miracle pill for you, but maybe he's not. And you really need to research. And it's just like we've talked about, like when you get an email from, you know, Amazon saying your account is broken, you don't follow the email, you go to amazon.com and log into your account. And that's kind of how you have to approach everything. You have to be skeptical. And I I always, I don't want to say get upset because I think anyone can do what they want on social media, but people who like rail about the evils of social media on Facebook, I have a bunch of friends and I communicate with those friends and everything else I tune out on Twitter. There's a, a, a pretty active FinTwit community. And I, and I look at that stuff, you know, I, I, I look at what the people I know are posting. Mm-hmm. So I think that's reality. Um, you know, create your own world. And if you want to go to, you know, to Twitter because you followed all your favorite sports teams, well set up your Twitter feed. So that's what you see. And on social media, I see my family, my actual friends, and people I've met while traveling. You know, I have a really active Facebook group with people I met on a cruise that we've slowly expanded. It's a, a positive part of my life, and I understand all the negatives on social media, but I sort of tune them out. And I also think that's kind of what you have to do with this. You know, if you're seeing people you don't know or celebrities you do know doing things that don't make a lot of sense on social media, you have to tune it out and look. The laws can do a lot. Globally, we need to deal with this. We also need standards on, you know, what they can do with, like, Elvis Presley's likeness and, and, and things like that. And it's kind of a whole new world. And, frankly, I'd like to see all of this not outlawed, but, you know, if, uh, you know, if Pepto-Bismol is using an AI-created creature to get me to feel better about taking their medicine so my stomach doesn't hurt, I want them to have to identify that this isn't a real person. And, and, you know, that's become really tricky. And I don't think we're going to figure it out in the next few years. I, I think this is really the, the key issue outside of privacy is really how do you figure out what is real and not real? Because the technology is and as an individual. I'm not talking about you can't rely on other people to do that for you. You have as an individual need to do the research, spend the extra time and to discern whether something is True or not. All right, Dan, let's shift gears because I want to talk to you about something that we have talked about. You know, we often talk about streaming. Streaming is um, very popular. Uh, It continues to grow, whereas uh, the cable industry and uh, using those services has has really contracted. MGM was bought by Amazon and that deal finally closed. Want to get your thoughts on that and, and what does that mean? Well, it means Amazon has thrown away $9 billion or eight point something billion dollars uh, to continue to pursue its vanity play of being in the television business. I Look, I'm not saying there isn't some good television on, on Amazon Prime. I really liked Foundation. Upload was interesting. I'm sure there, there's other things. But here's the reality. Do I get Prime because it has Prime Video? 
the answer is no. Like I get Prime because of delivery. So why are they giving me this expensive TV service that that mm-hmm. absolutely doesn't need to exist? The reality is there's more than enough good television, and these shows would have existed in in other formats and maybe pushed out some terrible shows that have been created. So this is just Amazon just throwing money away so it can say it owns all this stuff. And I, I see literally no benefit to their business. What, what shows are we talking about at MGM? MGM was at one point, uh, you know, founded in the 1920s. It was like at the height, everything, they produced everything. I mean, they had all these character actors and people that were contract actors, part, part of all their publications. What does Amazon get? What properties does it get? Anything that I would know of? Yeah, I, I think the prize is is James Bond, and the ownership of James Bond is tricky. But let's say this more or less gives them more or less gives them ownership of James Bond. It also gives them ownership of the Rocky movies, which seems a little ridiculous. But there was sort of a revival with Creed that that maybe there's some life in that, mm-hmm. um, and it gives them like a whole bunch of archive content. Uh, Thelma and Louise, Silence of the Lambs, The Magnificent Seven, Raging Bull. doesn't seem like there's a lot of potential in doing anything with those movies, especially with uh, Silence of the Lambs. You don't control the rights to the characters. As we've seen, there's been a billion spinoffs of those Thomas Harris books. So uh, there's also some reality television and some other things that are part of this. But to me, it just doesn't make that much sense. I, I can't see what they're getting for this. Um, because, okay, you know, James Bond is an important property, but what is that? A movie every three years that does reasonably well, but not Marvel well? It's, um, it, I, again, I understand what they're doing. There's not a lot of products out there, but, you know, there's not a lot of content left out there to buy. But it just seems to me that Amazon, if they really wanted to, you know, to, to own all this stuff, could have just made deals with creators. You know, it's like, you know, it's great. They're, you know, they, they now own the rights to Licorice Pizza, a movie that's nominated for a bunch of Oscars that two people saw. You know, it, it, it's, it, you know, House of Gucci, Serrano. Like, I, I am not entirely sure why you want to own all of these, like, expensive Oscar bait projects that, you know, kind of nobody watched. Yeah. Well, Dan, on, on the same note, this is not a story that you and I talked about beforehand, but it's, I think it's an interesting story. Uh, the shift to streaming. Um, ESPN recently picked up Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, who were doing shows on Fox, for gobbles and gobbles, gobbles of money for Monday Night Football. And I just want to get your reaction to this. Uh, you're a big sports fan, but I, and I think they do a great job. But is it, are they really worth <laughs> worth that amount? I no. guess they are. No, to, no, they're not. To ESPN, they so, are. <laughs> so multiple problems that this causes. First of all, nobody watches a game because of the announcers. If, if you've got Cleveland Browns, New York Jets on a Monday night in week 15 and the teams have five wins between them, I don't care if it's uh, Tony Romo and, and, and the you know, return of Elvis to bring up Elvis a second time. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So are they good announcers? Sure, they're fine announcers. Were the people whose names you don't remember who did Monday Night Football this year pretty good? Yeah, they were pretty good. And we, we watched the Manning cast to have the alternate broadcast. The problem this creates for ESPN is ESPN has been shedding salaries. They've been very careful. They've paid up big for Stephen A. Smith, for Mike Greenberg, but those salaries look tiny compared to what they're paying Troy Aikman to do essentially 17 games and a, and a playoff game. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense at all. Because if you're Stephen A. Smith, are you going to go, hey, I want $10 million more million? If you're every person that ESPN has deemed as relevant, that, that they were saying, well, we'll keep you, but yet, you know, we're going to cut your salary or we're not going to give you a big raise, does ESPN have any leverage with any of those people anymore? And I understand there's not a ton of places to go. You, but you saw Mike Golick, you saw Kenny Mayne, you know, in Golick's case, they didn't want to keep him. In Kenny Mayne's case, they offered him like a 40% pay cut. Well, Kenny Mayne works a few different places, but largely for Caesars, and he probably got a boatload of money to not do that much work. So there are places for people to go. What is this going to mean you know, for Adam Schefter, for Adrian uh, Wojnarowski, both of whom have deals that are up where there's heavy interest from the sports betting world to pay them a bunch of money? I think ESPN just panicked 
there's always a lot of news coverage about who the Monday night booth is. And I guess this ends that question, but is that a good thing? Like, wasn't it kind of good for ESPN that there was endless speculation and media coverage of who might be in the booth? Um, this, this makes, this makes no sense. And sure, we won't have to deal with Booger McFarland in a, in a, you know, uh, vehicle driving around the game anymore, but I, I'm not sure how this solves the problem and doesn't create a whole bunch more. Yeah, I, I know I speak for you when we would, you, and I say we would have done it for half, right? I mean, we would have done it for half that amount. I, I, I mean, think the problem is in the announcing world, the difference is tw- you're a $20 million guy or you're a $600,000 guy. And I know those both sound like a lot of money, and they, of course, are a lot of money, but you're either Aikman and Buck and Tony Romo and – you know, Al Michaels to an extent, or you're everybody else. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not so sure whatever, you know, however many million, six, eight million they're paying Mike Tirico at NBC. Does anyone really care if Mike Tirico is doing their game? And he's unbelievably good at it. Um, this is a very strange world where we're paying up this money, much money for Troy Aikman. And honestly, I'm a football fan. Would I have even remembered that Troy Aikman was doing games? No, I, I really wouldn't have. And I know Tony Romo got all that money. Tony Romo's super annoying. Like his his whole point is to show you how smart he is. And I know some people like that. To me, I don't understand it. This, this is just look. I want everybody in media to get all the money they can, but this to me just probably takes away two hundred other jobs at ESPN. It, it's a problem. It's a waste of money. It's not going to mean anything in the ratings. Um, and they got their publicity. And if you're Joe Buck, why exactly did you want to leave the network where you also got to do the World Series? Like, and, it, and there's been nothing about him being part of ESPN's baseball coverage. He's going to produce content for ESPN Plus, which uh, is essentially saying I'm going to produce content for no one. Well, um, look, I think it's interesting. I, I think that it is an exorbitant amount of money to pay uh, for somebody. And I guess we're just going to – I agree. You know, when, Dan, when I watch uh, the Ravens, I turn on, I turn down the sound, and I turn on the radio broadcast so I can hear uh, the Ra- the Ravens radio announcers. Dan, we're gonna have to leave it there. Always great chatting with you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll talk again next week. I'll see you next week. Thanks, Jeff. Bye, Dan. Bye. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest? Someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line, and don't forget. For all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives or see our latest content? Well, check out our website. That's www.broadcastretirementnetwork.com. And our streaming partners like Amazon, Roku, Samsung, and over 100 more. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. We'll have a very special guest. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.